Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. But we started talking about the table. And we said that the table is a metaphor for the church. Everybody say, the table is the metaphor for the church. For example, you decided to come to Elevate Church today to sit at the table of God the Father. You came here, you're sitting at the table of God the Father where you're being fed a word from heaven, right? You're being fed through worship. You're being fed through scripture. You're being fed through inspiration. You're being fed through motivation. Today you came and you decided to sit at the table of the Father, which for that I say thank you so much for waking up and saying, I'm going to put God first today. So give yourselves a big hand, quickly. And what I'm sharing with you today is the fact that many of us, we come and we sit at the table. So there's two tables here today, all right? So this is the communion table. This is the table where we come to church. And that right there, that table today will symbolize the great feast. It's a different table that God wants us to invite others to. And what I'm talking to you about today is the fact that Jesus Christ wants each and every single one of us to be the kind of people that are going out of our way to reach people with the love of God, to reach people with the mercy of God, to reach people with the grace of God, to reach people that are far away from God. And we talked about the three chairs, right? Last week we talked about there are three different types of chairs at the table, which is a metaphor for the what? church and so there's three chairs and we talked about each one of those chairs and i'll touch a little bit more on that but we know that the table is a place where we want to invite people to why because it's the church it's the only institution that god said through his son jesus i will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it do you realize that the gates of hell can pre can pre prevail against everything else but the church and you are the church you and I are the church. And so we have to remember to never, ever, don't ever, ever be above kneeling or crying in the presence of God. Don't ever be above that. As a matter of fact, don't ever be above reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You never want to live above the call of duty. Never, never, ever live above. You know what? Sometimes as Christians, we can become so saved that we feel like, I don't need to do anything more. I have my beautiful you know, crown of salvation, and you think you're just a wonderful princess, you know, or the men, we have the crown of salvation, right? And we're, we're his, his prince. But I'm a, let me tell you something. God has not clothed you to look pretty. God has clothed you and I to be dangerous. God has clothed us with righteousness. God has clothed us with, with, with power, with authority. God has clothed us to walk into situations like what we just did when we prayed for little Johnny, where we said, hell no, no one's going to have that child. That's God's child. Johnny will live and not die. We have to realize that we have been clothed with authority and with power. And when God's church speaks up, when God's church comes together, when God's church agrees concerning something or someone, God moves on our behalf. So we're not just, we don't just have the, the crown of salvation to say I'm saved and going to heaven and skipping hell. No, it's so much greater than that. We have been clothed with the righteousness and the love of God. And what's interesting, think about this. Just think for a second. Jesus was sitting at his table before he ever planted his feet on this earth. Jesus was seated at the right hand of who? Isn't that what the scripture says? So Jesus was saying, if Jesus had the audacity to leave his table, to leave the table, to get up off his seat and to come to earth, all because of what? Well, we know this. If you know John 3, 16, I want you to repeat it with me. Ready? Because I know many of you know this first, but the problem is that we have all this information, but we have yet to see a transformation of the global church. Are you ready? John 3, 16. For God so that he... Some of you are already mumbling. It's, that's okay. You sound like you know what you're saying, but you don't. Okay, for God so... Let's try this again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son... That whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. 
And so think about this. So God looked down to the earth and he saw a, a, a bunch of kids of his that were broken, busted, disgusted, that were completely separated from the presence of God the Father because of our unrighteousness, because of our filth, our dirt, our sin. And that kept us away from being in relationship with God. And then God is sitting at the table and he's having a conversation with his son and he tells his son, son, he says, I want you to go into the earth and I want you to sacrifice your life for all my kids so that one day we will all be joined together to the Father when we leave this earth. We will all be with the Father, every single one of us. And so Jesus was willing to leave his seat. Jesus was willing to leave his place at the table to come down to earth. It was it was the love of God for the earth. He said, for God so loved the earth, for God so loved the world. He didn't just love America. He loves the world. He doesn't just like white people, black people. He loves all the earth. He loves everybody in this earth. And God begins to tell Jesus how much he loves you. And, and, and as Jesus is looking at the Father at the table, he's being compelled to get up off his chair and to leave everything that's in the kingdom, to leave his divine place and position and to come to this earth so that he can reach you and me. How awesome is that? That God will leave his chair. But we know that, listen, when you leave the chair, because I know we love the chair, right? We love the whole comfy chair. We love community. We love to be at the church. We, love, we know that Jesus is the bread of life. Remember that last week? So he's the carbs of life. Come on, somebody. Nothing wrong with carbs, right? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Eat me. I love that. But when, when, when Jesus is sitting with his disciples at the table of communion, at the table of intimacy relationship, his 12 disciples are sitting there. But we know that three of them had like the inner, inner circle. It was three of them, Peter, James, and John, who knew the secrets and the mysteries of God. Like they knew like the deepest most secrets of Jesus so much that the Bible says that John puts his ear on the chest of Jesus and he's leaning in he's wanting to get some information he's wanting to get close but so, so many times we come to church many of us and we love the preaching not just for me Every person that I, I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to be biased, but I think that every single week that you come here, whether it's me speaking, my wife, or whether it's someone else speaking in this church, I truly believe that every single one of us always gets blessed in this house. And the worship, was worship awesome? Come on, somebody. And so we love what we have at the table. We love the preaching. We love the worship. And we're just like, yes. And we love the, the love battery. And we love, you know, the youth ministry. And we love this ministry and that ministry and, and the reach. And we love all those things. And we love the table. But so often, many times for many of us, we don't get out, get off the chair and leave the table. We're just, we're just so comfortable. It just feels so good. And how many know that, that God so loved the world that he sent his son? And Jesus so loved the world that he told his disciples the same thing. He says, I'm sending you into the world, and I'm commissioning you. That's why the Great Commission is called that. Why? Because anything that you do for God is going to be greater than anything you do on this earth. Your business is not greater than God's plan. The things that you can obtain on this earth is not greater than what God wants to give you. I really believe that we as a church, we are not in a season. We're not. Say it with me. We're not in a season. We're not in a season of, great, of, of a great move of God. You know what we are? We're in a great era of a great move of God in the church and through the church. The question is, do you see the era that we're in right now? That heaven wants to move through your life. That God wants to do amazing things in you and through you to reach the most far away people from God. Those that are hurting. God wants you to bring a word in season that's going to bring people back to the Father. Why? Because once Christ comes back, guess what, guys? We're hopefully all going to be in heaven with, with Jesus. And that's, that's why he sent his son. God's love motivated Jesus into action, guys. It was his love. It was a father's love that motivated his son 
to go into action is love. I love that. When you're reaching people or when reaching people isn't an exercise of your daily diet, you're living above your call of duty. Okay, let me tell you what that means. He says, I'm the bread of life. We said this last week. We sit at the table and we feed on Christ. The problem is, is that we feed so much. We're inundated with information in America with, with, with great podcasts, great teachings, great leaders. I mean, we're just inundated. Any information you want from worship to messages to leadership to parent. I mean, we're just inundated, inundated. But what happens is we're feeding, we're, we're, we're chewing on this stuff which is in our mouth, but we're not digesting it. God doesn't just want you to come to church so that you can hear a message. God wants you to come to church to hear the message, chew on the message, digest the message. And when you digest the message, that's when you begin to exercise and nurture yourself. And then you become more like Christ Jesus. But we got too many obese Christians in the church. All kinds of word. That's good. We got, we got like, like, you know. What's that little cute animal called? A chickmunk cheeks. Yeah. Why? We just have word, word, word. God's saying, chew on my word. Meditate on my word. Observe to do all that's written in it. Then you'll have good success. And he says, and then you'll make your way prosperous. And so God is saying, come on. Look at what 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three says. This is the Apostle Paul. He says this. He says, I have handed down to you. What came to me. So I have handed down. So it's like me. I get something from God. I give it to you. I handed it down to you now. He says, I have handed down to you what came to me by direct revelation from the Lord himself. The same night in which he was handed over, he took bread. Come on, somebody. He took bread and he gave thanks. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Today, you're taking bread. You're hearing the word of God. You're hearing the message of Jesus. And we have to thank God that we came to church this morning and that we're being stirred in our spirit, right? And so we're saying, thank you, Lord, that I made it to church this morning. And he says, and he took the bread and he gave thanks. And then he distributed it to the disciples. And he said, take it and eat your fill. Come on. God wants you to leave, leave this place today full of peace. Full of joy, full of like, man, I'm so glad I, I'm glad I didn't miss church. Now, if you're the person that says, well, I ain't getting, I ain't getting fed here. Let me tell you why you're not getting fed. Because you're too full of yourself. <laughs> Listen, you, you can't eat when you're full. You can only eat when you're hungry. And a perfect sign of a healthy Christian is a Christian who is hungry. A hungry Christian simply means this. They constantly chew on God's word and they digest it. Someone who says, I'm not getting fed. You're just full of yourself. And God can't feel full. So when he sits them at the table, he says, and they all ate until they were filled. All of them. And so he says, um, so he gave thanks he gave them the bread. They all ate till they were filled. It is my body which is given for you. He says, do this, do this to remember me. Everybody say, remember me. So he says, so I want you to do this to remember me. And he did the same with the cup of wine after supper said, this cup seals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it. And whenever you drink this, do it to remember me. Whatever you eat, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the story. You are what? Retelling. Every time you feed, every time you drink, you are retelling the story. I love this. You are retelling the story, proclaiming our Lord's death until he comes. Now, mind you, this is the Apostle Paul who is retelling his story to the disciples that were sitting at the main table with Jesus and he was telling them, man, it was amazing because when they were sitting together, they were being intimate. They were, they, were, they were communing with Jesus. They were connecting with him in levels that were just incredible. But they came to a place where Jesus was telling these disciples two powerful words. He said, remember me. Everybody say that. Remember me. Media, stay with me. And, and he says this because we says, he says, and whenever you eat this bread... And whenever you drink this cup, you are retelling your story. You're proclaiming our Lord's death until he comes. And I totally get it. I get it. I, I've preached this message, this scripture context many times. But this one's very interesting because he's saying when you're taking this, every time that you and I uh, 
feed on God's word, every time you and I drink of God's word, he says, you're remembering me. And I love that he used the words, remember me, because he knew that we're kind of people that forget. You know what I'm saying? Like, have you ever forgot someone's name? Let me see all my name forgetters. Now, come on, we, all, we, man, we suck at that, right? Yeah, it's like, and we're, we, we all do the Christianese stuff, right? So when you see somebody like, brother, hey, sister, woo, champion of the most high God. And we make them feel like we know you. No, we don't. You forgot their name. Or have you ever gone shopping at the mall and, and you, man, you, you go shopping, you buy your stuff. It's not even like 10 minutes you were in the mall. You walk out and you're like, dang, where did I park my car? <laughs> Had anybody like that? Let me show my car forgetter parkers. Yeah, I, to this day, and we know, we all know what we do. We hit the panic button on our alarms and then we're like, boop, boop, or boop, boop, and we're looking for the car. And you look in the parking lot and everyone's doing the same thing. Come on, we re listen, we forget appointments, we forget names, sometimes we forget to pay a bill. So Jesus is like, man, I know what kind of people you're going to be. You're going to be a forgetful kind of people, I know. So remember me. What does remember me mean? He means repetition, repetition, repetition. When you do something in repetition, you won't forget. When you don't, do, when you don't live a life of repetition with Jesus, you will quickly forget him. And so he's saying, when you feed with me, remember me. Remember me. This morning, you remembered him. This morning, you're here. And we all have been in that place where we've even told our children, and I got my daughter here, like, clean up your room. Of course, this is when she was younger because now she's perfect. <laughs> clean up your room. Wash the dishes. And you know what? You get back home, and you see the room's jacked up. Dishes aren't done. And you're like, what happened? They're like, oh, I forgot. And it's like many of us, right? It goes in through one year and it goes out the. Anybody got kids like that? Yeah, they just, it's almost like they have like this spiritual amnesia happens or something, you know? <laughs> Literally, they just forget. I think that's what happens to the church a lot. The church has a lot of spiritual amnesia. It's like we forget. Oh, wait a minute. You mean, you mean we're supposed to forgive? I'm, you mean I'm supposed to love? I'm, I'm supposed to be kind? We are forgetful kind of people. So Jesus says, remember me. Remember me. When you want to go ahead and say what's on your mind, remember me. When you want to hate, when, 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 when you want to get ugly, when you're being persecuted, remember me. When someone flips you off, gives you the finger, remember me. <laughs> Jesus said, they flip me off too. Right? And so he says, Remember me. Here's the truth. Write this down. We forget what we're supposed to remember, and we remember what we're supposed to forget, don't we? We're so good. We're, man, we're like, we got degrees in forgetting what we're supposed to remember. Yes or no? Like, man, we, we forget what we're supposed to remember, and we remember what we're supposed to forget. We're so good at remembering who betrayed us, who hurt us. We are so good at remembering who offended us. We are so good at remembering our past, our flaws, our failures, our sins. And you know what? Who's good at that? Satan's good at that. That's why he's called the accuser of the brethren. He reminds you that you suck. He'll tell you stuff like that. Like, you, you suck. And you know what we do when that happens? God says, no, I want, when that happens, he says, now remember me by reminding him of his future. When Satan wants to remind you of your past, you remind him of his future. Boy, you are defeated. You are over. You are done. Amen. We're, so, we're good. We're good at remembering everything. But remember me. Yeah, we were so good. We remember the past. We live in our past. We live in our hurt. We live in our pain. We remember that real good. We won't, it's like God wants us to remember his truth, and we remember all the lies. God wants us to remember his love, and we remember the rejection. Say this with me. Say, remember me. Come on, we're supposed to forget our past and remember our future in Jesus. 
remember me. Come on, we're talking about remember me. And by the way, we are going to have communion on Good Friday, by the way. You don't want to miss it. Good Friday, we have two services, and we are going to remember him. And so basically, Jesus is saying here, don't forget me. Don't forget what I did for you. And how many of us have honestly, genuinely, we have forgotten what Jesus did for us. You find yourself in a very difficult, challenging time in your life, a season where maybe all hell has broken loose, but you've been there before. Can Listen, please understand, none of us are experiencing anything that we didn't already experience in the past. None of us. Just think. Just take a step back and remember when he, when he saved you. How jacked up were you? Now, remember where you're at today. How jacked up are you? The same one who delivered you from jacked up then is the same God that will deliver you from jacked up now. The same one that will deliver you from being jacked up now is the same one that will deliver you from being jacked up tomorrow. He's the same. Remember me. Remember me when I delivered you. Remember me when I healed you. Remember me when I touched you. Remember me. And then things, things can change. But when you're always remembering the past... How's that, gonna, how's that working for you now? Is that helping anyone here? No, it doesn't help you. But I don't want to forget. Okay. Then live in your past. But I don't want to let go. Okay. You tell me how toxic that's going to be for you. Remember me. Okay, let's talk about the three chairs quickly again. Do you remember the first chair? The first chair is this one. It's the unbeliever. So in the church, you've got three types of chairs. Chair one is the unbeliever. It's the person that has doubts. It's the, it's the, uh, the Christer Christians. Sit in chair number one. What's the Christer? It's the Christmas and Easter Christians that only come on holidays. It's, it's okay. They're far away from God. and Why? Because America says that, that 80% of Americans are born-again saved Christians. And here's the reality. No, it's not true. No, it's not. It's not. It's by far that. Because being a Christian is not being born into religion. Being a Christian is being a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay? You're not born into religion. It's just like many of us. Okay, I was born into Catholicism. I didn't want to be a Catholic. But because my family and my family's family and my family's family, everyone's Catholic, so we're all Catholics. We go to school, what religion are you, Catholic, I guess? And, of course, I saw a lot of negative things. There's nothing wrong with Catholics, okay? I love the Catholics. They're very devoted people. But the, the Catholicism I saw growing up was very twisted. You know, you go to church, you leave church, man, pound all the beers and get into the fights, the arguments, you know, and then go back next Sunday again, do the same thing. And uh, the Catholicism I saw is that there was, there was a lot of mixing of, of, of white, white magic with Catholicism, and we did it all in the name of God. And so for me, it was like, no, you know what happens in America, too, is many of us have been born into religion. And let me tell you something. God's not about religion. God's about a relationship with you. God wants to have an intimate, personal relationship with you because once you find intimate relationship with Jesus, you'll get free from the bondage of religion. Religious will keep you from ever being completely set free because whom the Son sets free is free indeed, free indeed. And so we have to come to that place of intimacy. So, you know, the chair one is the person that's far, they're far away from God. Those are the ones that that we have here every single weekend. And maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, I was born into religion. I totally get what you're saying. Man, I, I just say I'm a Catholic or I say I'm a Christian because my grandma prayed for me. So I'm a Christian. No, you're not a Christian until you finally say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my. It's a personal thing. So that's chair number one. Chair number two is the baby Christian. It's the newly saved Christian. It's the fresh faith Christian. It's the Christian that's still learning God's word and they're still learning to evaluate, you know, what's sin and what's not. It's the, it's the Christian also that, that is so excited about their, 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 their touch from heaven and, and they're pumped up and they just can't wait to go to church. And, and they know, of course, it's not careful. It can start you know, very, very uh, emotionally driven. But how many of you, we need to go from a place of just being emotionally excited to having some roots, to having a foundation. And I know that in every church, we have Christians that have been saved 5, 10, 15 years that are still on chair number two. See, chair number two easily gets offended. 
Chair number two is the kind of person that is new in the Lord. If you even say anything that contradicts what they're just learning, they'll go religious on you, right? They're, they're critical. They're judgmental. Uh, why? They're in their process. They're still trying to process, what does this whole Christian stuff mean? And so they're in the process of change and transformation, and, and, and they're, they're easily offended, and they're easily hurt, and, and they're easily bothered, and, and, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that if you're in chair number two. It just means that, man, I'm, I'm trying to get closer to God. I'm trying to grow just a little bit more. Nothing wrong with that. These are people that still have trouble tithing. These are people that are still have trouble serving. These are people that still have trouble, you know, believing here and there, but they trust God, they believe God, but then they doubt here. It's not a big deal. Chair number three, on the other hand, is the spiritual mature believer. That's the person that's constantly, you're growing constantly in Christ. Like chair number three right here, that was two, three. Chair number three. You're growing constantly. You're growing in godly character. As a matter of fact, you're growing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know what those gifts are? You're growing in the character. Come on, you're growing in love, joy, patience. What else are they? Nobody knows. God bless you. Read your Bible. Galatians chapter 5, okay? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, self-control. We're maturing. We're getting but We're not perfect. But we're getting better. The, the, the chair number three is constantly growing emotionally, mentally, relationally. Uh, they're, they're the people that are retelling their story to people. They're the people that never forget. They're the people that know, remember me. They know. They're always sharing their story with someone else. They're the people that expand the church. They're the people that grow the church. They're the people that are focused on chair number one. Listen, chair number three is focused on chair number one. Why? They're winning souls. They're reaching people. And while they're doing this, while their focus is on chair one, chair number three is developing chair number two. They're telling them, hey, man, at some point, you got to come over here. So, so many of us, listen, we, we, I hear this sometimes. I don't hear that much here, but I've heard it in my, in my 22 years of walking with you. I need something deeper, Pastor. I, we need to go. When are we going to go deep? Can we? Can, can we go deep? Oh, I'm not being fed. Can we go deep? Deep in the river. Deep in the river. Uh, I don't swim. I dive. I'm a diver. Let me tell you something. For all my deep people. The true deep Christians are the Christians that are always winning souls. You can't go deeper than winning souls. Why? That's all Jesus did was win souls, make disciples, and touch lives. That's all he did. You want to be deep? You don't need another revelation from God. We don't need another word. We got too much word in America. We need some movers and shakers. We need some people to have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And we need to get off of our chair and do something and just stop remembering our past. You're paralyzed if you're not careful. You're stuck. You're in a rut. Just being a Christian, just having the title, it's not enough. You and I will stand before God one day, and he is going to take account of your life. What are you going to say? This happened to me, that happened to me, this happened to me, that happened to me. They heard me. They, 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 they. What are we going to do? We go from why, why, why to wah, wah, wah. When is that going to end? Listen, if you want to be a wah, wah, stay in chair number two. But at some point, you got to stop wang. And you got to say, okay, you know what? I, I, I have too much attention on me. It's always about me. My focus is on me. Now, now, that doesn't make you evil. It just allows you to open your eyes and say, it's time for me to grow from chair two to three. It's okay to be at chair two. It's okay. It doesn't make you wrong. It just evaluates. It examines where you're at right now and say, God, help me move to chair number three. And you three years. Listen, if you're a three... You're helping the chair number two. If you ain't helping chair number two, you're not a three. You're a two. I'm telling you, if you're not helping anyone in this church, if you're not praying for anyone in this church, if you're not discipling anyone in this church, you are a number two. You're not a three. A three will help. A three will focus on chair number one, winning souls, while he or she is developing chair number two. 
I know it's good. But what do we want? We like our carbs. He's the bread of life. Aren't you glad that we could eat bread? Keto, maquito, whatever, that got nothing on me. I got the bread of life. Man, we're going to tear some bread. <laughs> Listen, a chair number three takes full responsibility for the kingdom of God. A chair number three, you don't say, oh, I go to that church. No, you say, that's my church. That's my vision. That's, you take personal responsibility. I, I will fill God's house. That's, that's, if you're just an attender and you've been here for years and you think just because you know me personally, you're in. No, I love, I'm always going to love people. But here's the deal. God didn't give my wife and I a vision to do by ourselves. He gave us, you and me, a vision. When was the last time you came up to me and said, Pastor, what can I do to serve you? Versus coming to me, Pastor, this is what I want to do in this ministry. I hear a lot of that. This is what I want to do. This is what God's called me to do. Wow. How about ask me what I need? Ask me where, where we need help. Ask me how can we best serve our community. That's the chair number three. How can I be a blessing to my house? How can I be a blessing to my church? Amen. You ain't mad at me, are you? Well, you can because you're number three, right? <laughs> number three people don't get offended easily. Number three people, they're not... They're not they're not accusing me. They're not hating on you. They're, 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 they're processing. They're saying, you know, he's got a good point. And all the church said, Amen. all right, let me see all my threes in the house. Just wave your hands. And, okay. All right. All right, deep sirs. <laughs> I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Are you guys getting something? I'm going to skip through some stuff. Is that okay? Okay, so check this out real quick, real quick. So there's a story of a demon-possessed guy. And the church, everybody say the church. They didn't want to deal with him. Who wants to deal with a demon-possessed person? I don't, right? Sometimes it's like, hmm. <laughs> yes or no? Right? I mean, we're talking, ah, I mean, I remember when I first, when we first started, like, in church serving our, our small group. It's like I attracted all the demon-possessed people. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. We would be there, and I'd be doing the teaching, right? My wife would be sitting there, and we're all like, <laughs> first of all, they would give me like a 10-page like a uh, outline, and that would be done in five minutes. Like, I would just read it, uh-huh, and that, 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 uh-huh, and that, I didn't know what to do. Why? I didn't care. I just did it. You know, I just, we wanted people saved. And next thing you know, I'm talking. You hear people go, what the? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. <laughs> With my little kids in the, in the, in the, in the house. We had a little apartment. We're just, just, we're just passionate. Just like, yeah, who wants to be a small group leader? Me. I know nothing. What the? And then we would see like this. Cra I'm not kidding you. I, that's why I love my, I love my, my story, how God wrote it. You know, because it wasn't pretty. You know, so it really helps me when I'm having difficult times. But, man, we'd get all the demon-possessed people. But then, man, we'd cast the devil out of them. I mean, it went from a, from a small group to a demon-casting household of small group. Like, go to the demon-casting small group on Monday nights at 7 p.m. And, and we would have people that would send flowers to the church. We were just volunteers. And they would send letters to the pastor say, you know what? We went to the Ruiz's house, and, and you know how embarrassing it was. But we were set free. Who wants to work with the ugly wants to talk especially when they're growling at you you know what I'm saying like, like, I, I, like, it's like stop it demon and we would cast the devils at it. and listen all I knew was the authority of his name I didn't know enough scripture to know how to cast this demon out you know what cast that demon out it was love love compels you to serve ugly well, the church didn't want to serve this guy. So you know what they did to him? They put him in a cave, and they chained him from his, from his hands to his feet. And look what it says. And as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed, he begged to go with him. I want to hang out with you more. I want to be with the bread of life. Why? Because once you get touched by God, you just want to enjoy the worship, enjoy the message, and, and enjoy the comfy, warm seat, right? 
And look, Jesus takes this guy from chair one to chair two to chair number three, like in 60 seconds. I'm not kidding you. Look, look what he says. He begged him. Look, the guy was like, please. He's trying to get in his boat. Please take me with you. Jesus like, no, get off my boat, man. Get, get. You know, I've already had, we've already had Jesus time with each other. Get off my boat. Look what he says to him. He says, Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how, um, and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and he began to tell, uh, to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And, and all the people, look, and all the people were what? So in other words, the ex-demon possessed guy went from chair one. He was like, ah, and he gets, and he, okay, he gets saved. He gets healed, and he's like, come on, Jesus, let's do this. I'll go with you. I'll be your disciple. I'll follow you to the ends of the earth. He's like, nope, come on. He says, you're going to chair number three. Go and tell everybody what I did for you. Listen, the guy, this removes all your excuses, uh, but I haven't been to small groups yet. Uh, but I need to go through love battery first. <laughs> like, uh, can I get a mentor in the church first, please? <laughs> what the? <laughs> this guy was so radically touched that love compelled him to go with no training. All he had was a story. The word decapolis that, that the translation of Decapolis is 10 cities, meaning that he went, to, he went to Jerusalem, he went to Damascus, he went to Nazareth, he went to all these 10 cities, and that brother literally became an evangelist, and he went to every single city, 10 cities, and he started preaching what Jesus did. These are the two things Jesus told him. Look at these points. Two things that Jesus told him to do, okay? Number one. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you. When was the last time you told someone how much the Lord has done for you? When was the last time? I'll tell you, if you haven't, if you can't remember, it's because you don't remember me. It's simple. It's okay. Number two, he said to him, and tell them how the Lord had mercy on you. Why? Because most people don't feel they deserve forgiveness. Most people feel that they don't deserve the love of God. Why? Because maybe you're still in your sin. Maybe you're still in your dark place. Maybe you haven't made the changes that you want to. But guess what? Jesus was teaching him to show the same mercy that he showed him. So when you meet gay people, don't hate on the gay. Love them with the love of Christ. Show them the mercy. Listen, your sin maybe didn't look like gay, but your sin was as bad as gay. It just had a different name. So we don't, listen, I don't, cond we don't condone a lifestyle of, of homosexuality, but I love every homosexual that's on this earth. I love them with the love of Jesus. Why? We have had people in this church that used to live a lifestyle of gay who are no longer living a lifestyle of gay and that are serving at Elevate Church now. You know why? Because we didn't condemn, we didn't, we didn't point the finger, we didn't put a guilt trip on you. We loved you to death. Amen. And that's the church. That's a chair number three. That's a chair number three. So now you got this ex-demon possessed guy. Well, what ex do you have? What ex were you a sin to? What ex addiction did you have? What ex goofiness did you live? Hopefully it's your ex. <laughs> I love this. All right, let me close. The church is the table. And many of you, many of you, you came to this house, this table, and we loved you. And your life has been changed. I know good, a good amount of you. I don't know all of you. But I've seen so many of you go through your process. And it's a beautiful thing. It's brutal, actually. Because sometimes you, you can get nasty. 
but it's beautiful when you get healed and you get past it. I want to show you a quick video of a story of what it looks like to bring people to the table. Watch this. Kanichua, Devin son. Kanichua. <laughs> hey, Devin, how you doing? Great. How's Great. Japan treating you? Oh, I love it. We love Japan. That is awesome, man. I love to see what God is doing in the the country, the wonderful country of Japan. And God has you and your amazing, wonderful wife, Mie, there. And uh, you know what? Uh, we talked and we were discussing this this whole topic of the table, the table being a metaphor yeah. of the church. And I know that prior to you being at Elevate Church, how long were you with us here? Uh, four, four years, maybe? Four years, four years. Uh, and, four years. Yeah. And, and and then eventually, obviously, you became a leader of our media department. And let me yeah. tell you something. You you literally changed our media ministry for the better since you. Uh, since, thank you. Yes, yeah. yeah, since you Definitely you've been a team here. effort. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Definitely team effort, but it took a leader. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you were a great leader here at Elevate Church. But um, prior, let's just talk about this because you know what? You're a guy who prior to coming to Elevate Church, you really didn't need God per se to help you with something that was pressing. Um, yeah. And right now we're talking to the congregation about who are you inviting to the table? And, um, and so I have a quick question for you. Um, who were you before you were invited to this table because you didn't just stumble into Elevate Church. Like someone actually invited you, right? Yes. yes. Talk to me about that. Well, well, my story was kind of interesting because at the time, before I came to church, um, I I was the guy, you know, I thought I had it all. I thought I, it was, my life was about what I could do. It was about me. It was a selfish life pretty much, you know, money, fame, business, whatever it is. That's right. You, you know, had fame. To, you had fame. Yeah. Yeah. You know, also, yeah, we had fame, you know, and I thought that was so important. You know, when you have fame, you have success. That means you are somebody. And that's all a lie, as we know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's who I was before. And, you know, what, what I what I noticed is that I had all those things. But at the top of it all, I was unhappy. And I didn't understand why at mm. that time. I know now, you know, it was about, it's about Jesus. But I didn't know then mm. I was missing something. So as I was challenged and struggling, I was, I remember I was at a gym and I was working out and these guys were talking about church and I'm working out and all of a sudden this voice, I don't know what it was, I know what it is now, but the voice drew me to these people who I didn't know. And I said, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, we go to church and they invited me to elevate church. And I said, well, I want to go. And they're like, yes. You want to come with us? So we came, and um, the first, I think the first time I went there, I didn't come alone. I came with myself. I came with one of my best friends who was a non-believer, kind of beefy guy. I came with my wife, who's a Buddhist Shinto, you know, non-believer, right? She was All the first things. to be away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And myself. Yeah. And um, that day changed my life, totally changed my life. I accepted Christ that day one of going to church. Was it someone here at Elevate Church that invited you to the table? Yes. Yeah, it was someone that was on the sound team. Okay. And, but it was one of those things where, you know, he just he just invited me. He said, you know, you should come. You should, you got to hear the music. I'm like, music at a church? You know, come on. <laughs> right? <laughs> you come from a background of music. So for you, yeah. when someone's telling yeah. you, like, you got to come because uh, music. So obviously this sound guy found a, a common a common ground of yes. conversation where, where yeah. he was trying to get your interest. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. As the worship team was playing, I, I was, we're looking at each other like, what is this, a rock concert? You know, it was, this is amazing, you know? So we're like, this is really entertaining. We like it. Um, I've never heard this type of music before. It was kind of like um, my background in music, but the message was different. Hmm. You know, the message had a different impact on me. You know, what did Christ in us? What does that mean? You know, awesome. so those are the things that right out of it, right out of the gate, that that's what we first three songs. We we saw that. How many months later did your wife come to Christ? Because it took her a minute. But 
Yes. But for whatever reason, she kept feeling the love of God at Elevate Church yeah. at the table. She kept yeah. getting received at the table. Yes. Nobody was judging her at the table. Nobody was no. making, her, making her feel like she didn't belong at the table. Every yes. time she came, she was yeah. embraced. She was loved upon like everyone here at Elevate All Church. Yes. But but it, it, how many months would you say it took for her to finally come to Christ like you did? Well, it, it, I love some of the things that you said, where there was no judgment. You know, we came, everyone just comes from acceptance and love, right? It's just sharing about God. That's it. So it took about six months. Now, this is six, this is a Japanese six months is a long time. They, <laughs> a they watch months. you, you know, yeah, yeah. there's like this, this, they have the microscope out, the binoculars, you know, yeah, they're yeah, watching yeah. every move you make. And we're human. I'm a new you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a new follower. So she was watching me, and, and the Holy Spirit started to work in her. Wow. And she continued to, to come to church with me every week. Um, and so did my friends. My friends came a number of times, too. And they're full-blown on fire for God now. You know, they're Christians. And so everyone who was there... Something happened that day. You That's know, awesome. the Holy Spirit changed us. Seeing your wife come to Christ must have been amazing. But your wife was so radically changed at the table yeah. to the point yeah. that she became this 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 Saul yeah. to That's this perfect. like yeah. this apostle Paul and yeah. and then writes a book in Japanese about her yeah. her whole life in in Buddhism uh, yeah. from Buddhism to Christianity and then here you are uh, just to kind of close it up but here you are now you both sold everything you guys sold everything your businesses your 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 homes, your cars, you sold everything for the call of God to Japan. And yeah. you guys have been there now. And, and of course, you now own another company there. You have a, a coffee shop, a pizza parlor, and you guys preach yeah. Jesus at, 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 at this business. Like you've literally given this business to God. And now you guys invite yeah. Japanese people that are far away from Christ to your table. And they're yeah. being changed, which is amazing and incredible. And um, what what also blesses me is that while you guys were here and before you left to Japan, you guys invited so many people to our table here at Elevate Church. And and now that you've been in Japan for a little bit over a year and a half, um, there's been so much change and transformation. And now we're talking about Elevate Church Japan. Yes, absolutely. And, isn't that amazing? Like, wow, well, who would ever yeah. say? That here well, God you... is expanding the reach, you know, that that's, that's what it's about. You know, he's multiplying. And, um, that's the part that's amazing about this. That's this, awesome. This is, it's coming to Japan. It's in Mexico. It's, it's, it's going to be a global movement. I love One it. body. Come on. Know? Come on. It's amazing. Yeah. What would you tell to the people that are listening to you right now? What would you tell them as we're getting ready for Easter? You know, Easter is only like three weeks away. Yes. Um, there are people out there that are like you. I think many times we're afraid of inviting people to church because we think like, well, they don't need God. Uh, they have it all together or they would never listen to me. But here you were a guy who had uh, you had fame, you had money, you had uh, you had just about anything and everything. You didn't need anyone to pray for your finances or to pray for your health, but you knew there was something missing. So it's yeah. the gospel is not just for the down and outer, but it's also for the up and outer. You know, the yeah. person that thinks he has everything or she has yeah. everything, but in reality, without Christ, you don't you don't have enough. Right. Yeah, so, we don't have even anything because without God, we're nothing. You're know? nothing. So what so, would you tell the people as we're getting ready for Easter? And you know how we do yeah. Easter here. Oh, Easter's amazing over yeah. there. So what would you tell people as we as we encourage them and challenge them to go out? and invite people to the table, to the great feast of God. Okay, yeah. So God uses us all. He doesn't just use one. He uses us all. So it all starts with asking. You know, come to church. Just come to church. Don't have any expectations. Just share the love of God and say, you got to okay. come and see this. You know? Okay. And he'll, when people ask you to go to church, sometimes you think, oh, well, they said no, right? But maybe... They said no to you, but the second person they said yes to. Yeah. So everyone has to come to the table. And everyone has to make an effort because it all is connected. Mm. God uses each one of us to connect. He's looking at our hearts, you know. So when we ask, he's like, yes, my children are asking, you know, because it's all about him. And he wants us to glorify him. So I say, ask. Just wow. 
be bold and ask. That's ask awesome. because they will come and God will change their life like Thank they did you. for us. Thank you, Devin. Thank you. Proud of you. And uh, we'll see you in Japan in June. Awesome. We will see you then. We love you. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye. Come on. One invitation changes one family's life who came to Elevate Church and who are now going to pastor Elevate Church Japan. In 2020, we opened Elevate Church Japan. My wife and I will be there in June to start building our teams and stuff like that. But let me tell you something. Never underestimate the invitation you're about to give to someone. Think, think this way. Think your most favorite restaurant. Like, I, many of you probably, I've said it all the time. What's my favorite restaurant? Ruth's Chris. Chris. You already know that. Okay, great. So, Ruth's Chris, you know, when you go to a great restaurant, it's always going to take a minute just to get in the table. You know that already. Because it's good. And I'll walk in the restaurant and be like, oh, yeah, uh, table for two. Yeah, 25 minutes, Mr. Rook. So I'm like, okay. I sit down. Doop, 25 minutes. <laughs> right? And we're just like, and then right at 24 minutes and 32 seconds, you're like, is my table ready? Why? We're impatient. We want to get it. And you're like looking, and you're looking at the people sitting at the table, and you're like, get the heck up already, will you? I want to sit at the table. That's what God's saying. Too many of us are just sitting there at the table. And God is saying, I want people to get off the table. I want people to get off the chairs so that other people can also sit in the chairs. It's not just about you. It's not just about me. It's about a dying world. Two quick scriptures and let's go. Look at what Romans chapter 10 verse 13 says this. It says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how? Everybody say how. How, how can they call on him unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him unless they hear about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone preaches to them? And how can anyone preach without being sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. In other words, God's saying, okay, Elevate Church, you've been sitting there. You've been comfy. You've been liking the preaching. You're coming back to the seat, but get your feet off. And start taking those precious feet of good news into the workplace, into the restaurants, into the coffee shops, into the gyms. We have a job to do, guys. How do I know that? Last week I talked about Jesus. He's talking to some guy at the table. And he says this, this story about inviting all his friends and family. It was a personal invitation and everyone made an excuse. And like many of you, you've already invited family members to Elevate Church. You've invited your coworkers. And they're like, oh, I can't. Da -da. Excuses, excuses, right? But Jesus does not allow excuses. Look what he says the next verse in Luke chapter 14. He says, then the master told his servant, go out to the roads. Go out to the country lanes. Make the people come in. Compel the people to come in. I want my house to be I tell you, not one of those people who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. That's ouch, isn't it? Listen, it's not just about, well, I already invited my, I invited all my cousins, my uncles, my aunts. I've already, and they all, they, they all said they're going to come, but they don't, no, 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 no. Jesus like, hey, listen, stop it. If I invited, Jesus is saying this, if I invited my friends, my family, and they didn't come, and they had all the excuses, you have no excuse to stop there. He says, I want you to go out to the roads, the country, the highways, the byways. I want you to look under every rock, under every stone. I want you to go and find someone. And please, don't be that church that invites someone that already has a church and says, there's my one. No, I don't want another Christian in here. I, I don't take that wrong. I'm talking about your invitation. I, we don't need to invite, hey, come to my church after you go to church. No, no. No, no, we don't need your Christian friends to see what Elevate does. We need lost and broken people that are far away from God to see what they're missing out on. And his name is Jesus. You got to tell man, I know that your marriage is jacked up. I know your kids are messed up. I know that you're struggling with this addiction. I know you have it all, Devin. The guy had fame. He's a famous drummer, man. This guy's traveled everywhere. He had businesses, cars, you know, Buy every you name it had everything and let me tell you something you can have everything and be empty everyone needs jesus everyone from the drug addict 
to the COO, to the CEO, to the president, to the owner. Everyone needs Jesus from the very bottom to the very top. But we have to go. How precious are the feet of them who go. Maybe you got stinky feet. The healing for that is go. Maybe you got a jacked up life. Why? Because we remember the past. You want to change your past? Start walking. He'll change your future. Start doing what he said. Let's not just get a mouth food, a mouthful of food. Chew, digest, and let's go do this thing. They need you, Marcos. God needs you. God loves you. God's not hating on you. He loves you. You've tasted his love. You've tasted his goodness. He loves you right here, right now. Just the way you are, he loves you. And his love will compel you. He's not judging you. He's not criticizing you. He loves you, Marcos. I, I pray that you know how much he loves you. And one day you will stand before God, Marcos. He needs you. You're special, man. You're going to finish what God called you to do. In the name of Jesus, and that goes for every single one of you, you will finish what God has started in you. You will not let shame, you will not let guilt, you will not let condemnation keep you in the same place forever and ever. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Get up. Rise up and let your eyes see your enemies be scattered. Begin to declare, man, though the enemy came in one way to take me out, that fool's going to flee seven ways because God Almighty is for me. He's not against me. His love compels me. His love moves me. His love heals me. But we got to open up again for that love. Amen. Stand to your feet. Let me pray for you quickly. Vamos. Let's go. Lift your hands to heaven. Grab your Easter cards. Did y'all get Easter cards when you walked in? Grab those Easter cards and lift them up and say, Father, pray this for me. Father, I thank you for your invitation to this table. Thank you for changing my life. Thank you for healing my life. I receive the great commission to go, to love, to reach, to help, to embrace those that are far away from you. I'm ready, Lord. Use my life in a special and unique way in jesus name i pray in that same attitude if you're sitting here today standing here today and you don't have a personal relationship with jesus why maybe you were born in religion maybe you thought just because your family are christians i'm a christian or a catholic i'm Cat no god wants a personal intimate relationship with you how do i do that you have to invite him you got to invite him to the table of your heart oh i don't want to invite him my heart man it's dirty that's okay. You know what Jesus would say? He's, he would say, I'm knocking at the door of your heart, and if you would just open, I would walk in, and we'll clean up the mess together. You need Jesus. Why? Because when you die, he is the only access point. He is the only door into eternity with God the Father. Without Jesus, you will not go to heaven. I'm telling you this. You will not. Good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And we all need forgiveness of our sins. Our sins have separated from us from God. And the only thing that brings us back to God the Father is his son Jesus. That's why he left his seat to save you. If you're here and you're saying, Pastor, man, I, I, this makes sense to me. I want to invite Christ into my heart today. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I want you to respond. How do I respond? You lift your hand high in the air and you say yes. And I'll lead us all into a prayer. The whole church, we'll all pray together. No shame in this place. Stop playing around. Stop messing with your salvation. Don't mess with your soul. Your soul will be with God the Father one day, but it starts with an invitation. Are you ready? At the count of three, you'll lift your hand high because you ain't ashamed. You're not afraid anymore. You know this is where God wanted you today. Ready? One, this is not an accident. Two, he loves you. Ready? Three, if that's you, lift your hand high quickly. Anyone here at all, lift your hand high as I see those hands. Anyone else, lift it high. Lift it high. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. 
Anyone else? You're saying yes, yes. All right, let's all pray. Thank you. I see that hand too. Let's pray. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Save me from my sins. Forgive me of each one of them. Today, I receive forgiveness. I receive your love. I'm born again, filled with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the salvation that I have received this day. I'm born again, saved, sanctified, and set apart for your holy purposes. I'll never forget. I'll never, ever forget what you did for me this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. All of you that lifted your hand, at the end of service, you just come up here. You come up here and you allow us to pray with you, connect with you. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.